Hello. Thank you for the opportunity to join you virtually this morning and discuss the promises and challenges of the e-learning transformation occurring in higher education. I'd like to begin by asking you to keep two questions in the back of your mind as you move about your day today. The first is, how do you see learning being different in our schools in three to five years? The second is more personal. What role do you think you will play in making that difference a reality? I'd ask you to hold these questions in the back of your mind as you engage with your colleagues and explore the possibilities and address the barriers of a new higher education ecosystem. Today, I'll share with you my observations of why we need to pay attention to and embrace the disruptions being caused by these new and emerging technologies and pedagogies. I will also speak to these challenges as they change the present for all of us as leaders in higher education. Addressing these changes is both the promise and challenge in an educational model that is a hundred of years old requires a different set of leadership skills and perspectives. In many ways, these disruptions are both the result of and the cause of the convergence and advances in technologies and a renewed interest in how people learn. We are in a period of intense examination of some long-held assumptions about the art and science of teaching and learning. Today, I'll ask you to think differently about your own beliefs regarding the teaching and learning experience and envision a new and exciting higher education landscape. My thoughts today are not just about online learning. The changes that I'm referring to will affect all aspects and models of education, including face-to-face -face or resident instruction, blended learning, and totally online education. I will use the term e-learning to describe the use of technology-enabled learning. I'm speaking of the potential of e-learning combined with the creative teaching techniques to transform our current educational system into something quite different than what we know and experience today. This transformation will be realized through the use of technologies such as tablets, cell phones, and other connected devices to a network of learners both local and global. This transformation will come about through creative teaching techniques using peer-to-peer -peer interactions, massive online classes, flipped classrooms, and learning systems that adjust to the pace and the style of the individual learner. This transformation, powered by the combination of technology and pedagogy, will fuel the creation of learning spaces that excite, engage, and inspire future generations of learners and teachers. First, let's review a brief history of e-learning. In the early 1990s, a few individuals and institutions were experimenting with the use of email, listservs, and discussion boards as enhancements to their face-to-face -face classes. Some early adopters were beginning to use the technology to reach students they would never meet. With the development of the World Wide Web in 1991 and the popularity of web browsing applications such as Mozilla and Internet Explorer, the rudimentary foundations of a fabric of linked networks connecting learners, teachers, and resources began to take form. For the most part, these early forays into technologies delivered education were easily dismissed by mainstream education because, well, the system was clearly flawed. The technology was faulty, the content was heavily text-based, and the support services for students were all but non-existent. There was a distinct quality difference in the learning experience for both the instructor and the student in the online learning space. In most cases, institutional infrastructures needed to be worked around rather than worked with in order to serve the needs of the distant learner. In these early days, the institution did not feel compelled to adopt and meet the needs of students not globally connected or geographically located at one institution. The face-to-face -face classrooms of the 1990s were also exper experiencing change. We were beginning to see the use of technology inside the classroom. Used at first as a presentation enhancement, this did improve the classroom experience by making the instructor notes more structured, organized, and finally readable. 
The impact of this early use of technology in the classroom was incremental rather than transformational. Around this time, we also saw the growth of the field of instructional design. Faculty were seeking input on how to best structure their class experiences with trained learning designers. The stage was set for the use of educational technology in the traditional classroom, and there would be no going back. Over the next 10 years, we began to see an increased use of technology supporting face-to-face -face instruction beyond presentation. This, the use of clickers to gain student input, pulling tools accessible with cell phones through Pull Anywhere, were beginning to be used in the classroom that connected students gathered in large face-to-face -face classrooms. Wireless access throughout the campus and computer labs distributed around the campus improved access for students. Discussion forums and team-based writing sites such as Google Docs were being used as a regular component of many resident-based courses. Beginning in the spring of 2002 here at Penn State, every resident-based course had a section automatically created in our learning management system called ANGEL. At first, not all were being used by faculty, but the foundation had already been laid. Students quickly became to expect easy access to course notes and presentations, discussion forums, and self-assessment techniques in every class they were enrolled in. From these humble beginnings grew the e-learning movement that, although slow to start, quickly took hold of the imagination of administration, teachers, and most importantly, our learners. One form of e-learning, totally online classes, began in earnest in the late 1990s. When the Babson Group undertook their first survey of online learning, there were hundreds of thousands of students reported taking online courses. Over the next 10 years, that number climbed to over millions of students in the U.S. alone. Today, students are taking advantage of a wide variety of offerings to advance their educational pursuits. Some are seeking certificates or undergraduate degrees and graduate degrees. In many of the over hundreds of programs offered online. In the past two years, we've witnessed the growth of a number of learners accessing informal and less expensive modes of study, doing this online through the use of MOOCs. In addition, open courseware and open educational resources, such as the Khan Academy, are gaining popularity. E-learning in its many forms is dramatically changing the higher education landscape. Over time, students skilled in the use of social networking tools brought these skills to their classroom experiences. Employers of these graduates were also expecting their graduates, uh, their new hires, to be familiar with the use of communication technologies necessary to stay competitive in today's marketplace. Aside from content expertise, their graduates were being expected to be able to function in a media-rich networked <coughs> environment. Let's speak a moment about the convergence of the technology and pedagogy. Today, the new technologies seem to come at us at a faster and faster pace. Many seem as though they were introduced overnight, and some gone just as quickly. Each one is faster, more mobile, smarter, and even more adaptable than the last. Most of these, these technologies offer capabilities we couldn't even imagine 10 or even 5 years ago. Coupled with these emerging technologies is a reconceptualization of what teaching and learning means in higher education. Concepts such as the flipped classroom, micro-credentialing, badging, data-driven and adaptive learning systems can all be seen as reflections of how we approach today's teaching and learning experience. Faculty and learners alike are experiencing a shift in the time-tested model of stand and deliver lecture to classes where the student is encouraged to take responsibility for their own learning and achievement. This change may be difficult for both the instructor and students alike. When my daughter was 18, year old, 18 years old, Erin took upon the challenge of her first online learning experience. But she complained to me one night at dinner that the teacher was making us do all of the work she was not quite prepared to take on the responsibilities of managing her own 
learning experience that was required of an online class. The method of being hand-fed content and being told what to study has given way to learners needing to own the process and direct and manage their own learning experience. This was a new, a new challenge for both the student and the instructor. The flipped classroom is another outcome of the convergence of technology and pedagogy we call e-learning. The flipped classroom shifts the dynamics of the class experience. Students access the course content outside the classroom and the instructor uses the face-to-face -face time as an opportunity to engage in a deeper and more meaningful exploration of the content. Faculty find a renewed interest in their content domain when they can expand on the basics and address more interesting aspects of their course. The students are also being drawn into the course materials because they're engaged to dialogue and think deeper about these topics. Many teachers have responded, I'll never go back to teaching the old method. Again, this new model has really stimulated my interest in teaching and reaching my students in new ways. MOOCs and flipped classrooms are just the start of the impact of the confluence of new technology and approaches to how we teach and how students learn. Gaming theory, peer-to-peer -peer learning, badging, and micro-credentialing, along with open learning design of classrooms and teaching spaces are all generating a renewed excitement around a model of higher education that is ripe for change. A concern raised by the convergence of technology and pedagogy is addressing the question of quality. How can instruction delivered electronically be as good as the instructor in the classroom? This concern has once again been raised with the popularity of MOOCs in the past several years. Is it possible to teach thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of students at a distance while maintaining quality? We are learning from these experiences that the answer can be yes, if you carefully consider what the definition of quality is. What we are learning about the delivery of MOOCs, for example, is challenging some long-held beliefs regarding the quality in online classrooms. We are learning that the instructor may not need to be the single source of all guidance, correction, and validation within this learning space. Through careful inclusion of peer-to-peer -peer assessment strategies, more than one person in the class can serve the role as teacher. Student-to-student -student interactions need not be restricted to the discussion forums. This confluence is just one factor challenging the status quo of all levels of our educational system. As promising or threatening as this confluence of technology and pedagogy may be, there are other pressures on higher education around the world. In the United States, the reduction of state and federal funding is seen as irreversible and demands swift and substantial change from leadership in order to survive. Shifting, shifting the financial burden to the student through increased tuition is a strategy that has already reached its maximum threshold. Increasing tuition can no longer be the single strategy for higher education to keep pace with rising institutional costs. Increasingly, institutions are being held accountable for evidence that justifies the investments students and governments make in their education. Tracking and reporting data, such as graduation rates in years to degree, has been a common output metric used to measure success. These measures alone are no longer sufficient in demonstrating the value of investment in higher education. Funding agencies are demanding accountability for its investment in grant and aid as well as low-cost student loans. Institutions are now considering a wider array of metrics that validate their output beyond student placement by tracking earnings and career moves once in the workplace. Likewise, while stu the student is engaged in their studies, renewed energy on improving student retention and course completion challenges universities to examine the support services, interventions, and strategies used to ensure that students reach graduation. The use of data analytics provides an ability to track student performance in order to intervene where appropriate. A learning management system with data collection and flagging capabilities can warn the instructor in the online class 
which students may be falling behind. This warning device enables the instructor to individually support students with counsel as appropriate. At a larger scale, the performance data collected from thousands or even millions of students in similar courses can serve as the basis of a predictive model program that guides the learner to the best path for their success. These data analytics systems can be employed in both the face-to-face -face as well as the online classroom. Through the creative use of low-stake assessment measures, the progress of learners in the class can be monitored and addressed. Another shift occurring in higher education is a move toward a competency-based educational model. Competency-based education articulates the definition of specific outcomes and competencies that can be measured and assessed. These competency-based models are designed to align with the defined needs of business and industry in order to better prepare students for today's workplace. For years, the model of higher education has held that time is a fixed factor and student achievement is variable. Students take a course for a 15-week semester and the grades will be distributed over a scale from A's to D's. Indeed, in some cases, we even measure the rigor of the course by this grade distribution. We need so many students at each grade level in order to demonstrate class difficulty. In contrast, a competency-based model holds time factor as variable and student achievement, that is gaining the skill sets and competencies, is fixed. We want all students to reach mastery. If a student requires more time to review the course material or to take the quizzes, they're able to do that until they reach and demonstrate mastery. Students stay engaged in their study for as long as it takes to achieve academic success. The online and blended learning systems can more readily be designed to accommodate a shift to this type of model. Let's speak about the emerging e-learning model. Today's learners have an unprecedented access to alternative methods of gaining the required skills and competencies necessary for employment. No longer is delaying entry into the job market the only way to advance your career goals. Today's learners can apply for credit review of work and life experiences with the intent of reducing the number of credits and therefore the cost of a college degree. Institutions are just now considering how to manage and evaluate this prior learning experiencing while directing students to their additional studies necessary to complete their degree. Another strategy to reduce cost is students enrolling their first two years in the use of community colleges or technical schools and then transfer to the academy for degree completion. Consider for a moment a flexible learning plan constructed for individuals that fit their personal learning style, time frame, and even their budget. In this system, the institution rallies resources and services around the needs of the learner rather than the learner adjusting to the structure, form, and format of the institution. In this model, the learner is guided through the arrangement of educational offerings that may consist of smaller units of study, credit for prior work and life experiences, as well as more traditional and formal courses of study. The institution providing the certificate or degree would need to validate the academic credential by the individual components in order to assure quality, but this model is becoming increasingly possible through the use of e-learning systems. Institutions of higher education, public and private, religious and secular, large and small, are all being forced to consider their response to the forces impacting by this e-learning transformation. Doing nothing is one response considered by some. Most, however, as indicated by a recent Babson survey, are embracing this opportunity for change. This is being demonstrated by the number of institutions indicating that e-learning is playing an increasing role in their strategic plan. A critical step in this process is that the institutions consider how the integration of e-learning matches the culture and mission of the institution. This step certainly presents a leadership challenge that involves trustees, advisory boards, senior administration, faculty, 
and of course students to thoughtfully and intentionally consider the options best suited to their institutions. There is a twofold promise of e-learning for institutions. The first is the use of e-learning to serve the needs of the resident student population through the integration of technology as enhancements to the existing learning infrastructure. Increasingly, as pr prospective students are evaluating their college options, the use of technology is becoming a criteria for selection. In order to remain competitive, institutions must present as robust a technology infrastructure as their competitors. The second promise of e-learning for institutions is meeting the needs of students studying apart from a geographic location. These individuals wish to complete their studies at their convenience of time and location. For these learners, online education offers a convenient method to access both undergraduate and graduate degrees from some of the top name institutions in the world. For institutions, the potential to deliver a cost-effective degree program to a large number of students in geographies not possible to reach through traditional models can lead to new tuition revenue. The opportunity to generate net new revenue during a time of decreased state and federal funding has not been lost on many. These same promises also present many challenges to a higher education model that has not significantly changed in form and function in the past 200 years. Most systems and services have been designed to meet the needs of a resident-based student population. The inclusion of a population of students who may never or only infrequently step on a residential campus stresses almost every aspect of the enterprise. The institutional response to these stresses may largely define the growth and expansion of e-learning within the institution. When Penn State launched the World Campus in 1998, it was not uncommon for our support units, such as admissions and registrations, to refer to students studying at a distance as World Campus students. The inference being that these students require special accommodations and were not fully Penn State students. Today that language has shifted to referring to Penn State students studying through the World Campus a subtle but important shift in perspective. Students both on and off campus are demanding more flexible learning options better suited to their lifestyle and circumstances. This again is a not so subtle shift in perspective of the institution accommodating to the needs of the student rather than the other way around. Today's learners are faced with a different social and economic reality than 25 or 50 years ago. More students are working today in order to pay for the cost of their education. This means they not, may not be able to access all of the course offerings at traditional class hours. They are requesting more convenient access to their studies through a variety of options. Along with their face-to-face -face courses, they may wish to enroll in several online courses that provide a more flexible schedule. Students have increased interest in and request for a more diverse and media-rich learning space. These students are familiar with media-rich social tools and respond favorably to, to learning systems that offer course content in their preferred learning format. These students present a new generation of tech-savvy learners who are at ease with the technology. One note of caution here. Just because these students are familiar with social media, such as Twitter and Facebook, does not mean they're ready to learn to use these systems for learning. Clearly, though, the seeds have been planted. Lastly, these students are primed for a more active and engaged learning environment, and these learners are getting impatient. Let's speak for a moment about the leadership attributes necessary from higher education leaders in this new environment. With this as a backdrop, let's consider the characteristics necessary in higher education leadership. What skill sets are most beneficial in leading in times of such great change and stress? How leaders in, of higher education today respond can define the progress or lack of progress necessary for the institution to survive 
and thrive in today's higher education marketplace. One brief story. A few years ago, I was asked to visit a small liberal arts school in an isolated region in our state. I had an enjoyable day visiting with faculty and administrators throughout the institution, sharing ideas for moving forward. The very last meeting included their provost. It was clear from his opening remarks that he did not envision a world outside of his geographic location, nor the idea of integrating technology into their classrooms. In his short presentation, he referred to his institution as traditional more than once and did not see the need to compete for students in the larger ether space. I reflected on his words on my way home and thought about his perspective and how this may restrict or hold back progress and growth where they would need to, they, their institution would need in order to survive. He would be long retired when the institution and the marketplace would catch up and I was wondering about the fate of that institution. Although there are many buzzwords that can be used to describe the characteristics of today's leaders, I'd like to focus on four as I see most critical in our workplace. Engagement, connectivity, awareness, and a global perspective. Engagement leads to connectivity, connectivity leads to awareness, and awareness leads to a global perspective. Engagement means many things to different people. As a leadership characteristic, engagement defines a willingness to connect to individuals and resources in and outside of their defined boundaries of the workplace. The engaged leader is one willing to roll up their sleeves and become an active partner as well as an active learner in the emerging trends encompassing, encompassing administration, technology, and pedagogy. The engaged leader is an active networker realizing the most intelligent and creative people may not work within your institution. Engagement leads to connectivity. Today's leaders operate in a complex web of knowledge creation and application, successes and failures. Becoming a node in this complex web of today's higher education network means seeking out, cultivating, and crafting personal relationships. These connections with individuals of shared vision and passion create win-win scenarios and successes. Connectivity requires an investment of time and energy to build trust in a culture of mutual respect. This foundation expands the input resources to our own knowledge base and leads to an increased awareness that supports a global perspective. With rapid advances in technology and pedagogy, and coupled with increases in scientific knowledge and new financial models, the need to be aware is as critical a leadership skill as ever. The network of resources and relationships established through our engagement and connectivity fuels awareness within our field and enables informed decision making and leadership with purpose. This awareness leads to a global perspective of not only our own institution, but also our place in higher education landscape. A global, perspective under, a global perspective of higher education suggests some degree of understanding of developments outside of our four walls. Even though we largely act locally within our own institutions, we must do so in an increasingly globally connected environment. So in conclusion, if you remember, I asked you to think about two questions at the beginning. How do you see the learning environment being different in, a, in our schools in three to five years? And secondly, what role did you see yourself playing in making that difference a reality? You may still be formulating your answer to those questions. I've had some time to reflect and consider my own personal response. For me, I see higher education at a very early stage of a reconceptualization based on forces both within and external to our institutions. I envision a radically different and ultimately more powerful teaching and learning space over the next five to ten years. A learning environment where the resources available to learners to gain their skills and competencies no longer come from a single source such as a university, 
but rather from formal and informal learning communities. These learning communities serve the unique needs of each individual learner. I do envision a role for institutions of higher education to serve the needs of a segment of our population that may no longer hold a, but we may no longer hold a monopoly as the sole source provider of our students' education. I sense that our existing models of higher education will need to accommodate and adjust to these forces of a new economic reality. I believe that the promise and future of higher education, although different, is incredibly exciting and bright. But that future will only be realized if we lead proactively and not strictly reactively. To embrace the challenge ahead, we need to see opportunities that leverage and make the necessary change. For my role in this transformation, I intend to be an active participant in shaping the future. My impact and legacy may be small, but it will be forward and progressive. I am challenged on a daily basis to consider how, where, and why I do what I do. I am also aware of the incredible opportunity to stay engaged and active in shaping an educational model that provides increased access and success for all seeking to better themselves through education. I hope you will enjoy me on this journey and I wish you the best at your program. Thank you.